Welcome back, America. Alan Hugh Hewitt. And I'm pleased to welcome back to the program Professor N.T. Wright, who was last on my show on March 22nd, 2013, when we discussed his book, mm-hmm. How God Became King. He's back to talk about a new book, a book that is the product of the 2018 Gifford Lectures. The Gifford Lectures were established a long time ago in 1888 to, um, to advance the study of natural theology. Now, this book, which I hold in my hand, is the product of those lectures. It's called History and Eschatology, Jesus and the Promise of Natural Theology. And it is very different from the other books of N.T. Wright that I have read. I had to get my friend Mike Regal, a very good theologian, to help me over some of the tough spots here. But it is well worth the climb. Professor Wright, welcome back. It's great to have you. Thank you very much. Good to be with you. Um, you've got the American edition there. I have the British edition here, but it's all the same inside. <laughs> oh, oh, good. I want to play, just for the benefit of the audience, what you wrote in both editions, but what you said when you stood up to give the first lecture to get us on the right note. Okay. Cut number 18, please. Okay. Cut number 18, Dwayne. My mother, now in her 95th year, asked me what these lectures were going to be about. I explained that some people used to think you could start from the natural world and think your way up to God from there, that other people thought that wasn't such a good idea, but that fresh thoughts about history might lead to fresh ideas about Jesus and thence to God after all, and that on the way we might learn something about the nature of knowledge itself. I thought that was quite enough to explain to her. My mother thought for a few moments and then said firmly, I'm glad I don't have to listen to those lectures. (laughs) Now, Professor Wright, I'm glad I got to read those lectures. I wonder if your mother has repented of that, if she's still with us and and has dipped into history and eschatology. No, sadly, sadly, she died um, on June the 1st, 2018. So not that long after the lectures were given and uh, which, which was expected. She was a day short of 95. And uh, she she would have she would have enjoyed holding the book in her hands, but I doubt if she'd have read it. Um, she 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 read my little books, but uh, never bothered about getting into the big ones. <clears throat> well, Professor, this is a book about parables that use parables, but it's also quite sweeping. And I I want to describe to you how I read it or the experience of reading it and get your reaction to it. I thought at one point I was sort of like a spectator at a football match. Uh, either American or English, but I could only see one team playing. I knew there was another team on the field. In fact, there were three other teams on the field, the Epicureans, the Platonists, the Aristotelians, and then there were the Second Temple Jews. And you were on the side of the Second Temple Jews. Or I thought it was like prepping for the bar exam, but only having dropped in and out of a few classes over three years, but having watched Rumpel and Perry Mason. And then I thought, you know what? It's really like climbing Mount Sherman, which is one of the 14,000 peaks in Colorado, which I did the end of which was really worth the effort, but it took a lot of wind out of me. You weren't <laughs> writing for me. Who were you writing this for? <laughs> oh, that's so funny. I've never climbed Mount Sherman, but but I've, I've done one or two smaller ones in, in Britain and elsewhere. Um, no, this, this book is, as you rightly said, the representation of the Gifford Lectures, which when you get the le- the invitation to do the Gifford lectures, that that's a real just to get the invitation was a real honor because it's uh, it's one of the academic pinnacles and it's designed to be a place where you can bring together um, serious reflections on these major issues. And I've been working for years as a biblical scholar on the questions at the interface of what we know about the Bible and how we read the Bible and the the bigger questions of God and the world and the problem of evil and how we communicate that and so on. So I was trying to pitch into there from the point of view of a biblical scholar and to say there's huge debates going on. And you mentioned Epicureans and Stoics and whatnot. Um, but actually, I was uh, equally as concerned with some of the major philosophical and theological and cultural movements in the 19th and 20th century. And I've had a lot of great feedback from this book um, from people who have been teaching and writing in these areas and have said that the synthesis which I'm offering uh, really has helped them get their heads around it. I'm actually in in e-conversation at the moment with an old friend uh, who is a retired priest in uh, Oregon. And uh, she has never been uh, a published theologian, but as a priest of many years standing, 
and a preacher has wrestled with the same issues and she has been really enjoying getting her teeth into it and it's, it's making her come up with all sorts of questions so it's people really like that people who are either clergy on the front line who've met these questions pastorally or in their preaching or theologians philosophers cultural critics people trying to understand how we've got where we've got in the western world and where we, what we should do about it now. And particularly, does the Bible and does Jesus have anything to contribute to these discussions? So hopefully it was designed for everyone. I hope it's, I mean, the, the subject matter may not be straightforward, but I hope the style of writing, at least, you found comparatively easy to live with. Oh, I did. I had to read it with Mr. Google, and I had Mike okay. Regal to help me, and I will yeah. at, talk at length with Dr. Mark Roberts, our mutual friend, about it mm -hmm. when I next see him. But I found it to be fascinating because my undergraduate work was in political theory uh, from mm -hmm. the Straussians, and my life has been spent in constitutional law. And I, I found that you were a saying over my fields. I mean, you would go out of theology from these people named Boltman and Schweitzer and Tillich and Barth, and you would wander into the Platonists, and you would duel with the Aristotelians. And I thought, oh, this is wonderful. It's all coming together. But you were doing so from a perspective of Second Temple Jewish yeah. eschatology. Would you explain to the audience why that's different and how it is? Yeah. It's actually a challenge to everything I just named. It, it really is. It really is because the, the Jews were different, and Jesus was a Jew, and Paul was a Jew, and they were thinking like Jews because the Jews were living in this great story, which was the story of God and the world. The story you, you get in the, their Bible, what we call the Old Testament or the Hebrew Scriptures. And that story was an ongoing narrative. It's rather like the Roman Empire in Paul's day had a great story which people were telling about how it started off for seven or eight hundred years ago. And it was a republic for a long time. And then there was a big crisis. And now we have an emperor and it's Caesar. And uh, so life is now wonderful. And, and of course, nobody quite believed that. But that was the official narrative. But in the same way, the Jews had a much longer story, which was we go back to Abraham, Isaac, Jacob. We've got Moses. We've got the Exodus. We've got King David, etc. But the world is a dark and difficult place. And the pagan nations have been beating up on us for the last 500 years. And our God has promised to do something about it. And how is that going to happen? What's it going to look like when he does? And within that, they had symbols, namely the temple, which they believed was the place where heaven and earth came together, and the Torah, the place where heaven and the instruction of humans comes together. And those guided who they were. Now, so often people in our day have said, oh, we can't go back to thinking like first century Jews because we are now modern Westerners. And one of the main things I'm trying to get across in this book is that the idea of us modern Westerners being different from the ancient world because we have modern science and technology is pure smokescreen, that what the Western world has been doing is living on a retrieval of the ancient philosophy called Epicureanism, which is, if there are gods, they're a long way away upstairs, we are down here, they don't bother us and we don't bother them, um, to which most Christians have responded by saying, oh, we'll be Platonists, we have a soul which is yes. going to heaven somehow. Um, and I'm saying that is the wrong way of going about it, because we ha we should get back and retrieve the Jewish perspective of Jesus, Paul and the rest, which is that God and his human creatures have come together in a totally new way, as always promised in the Old Testament. And now we should be living out of that, not translating it out into various forms of either ancient Greek or modern European philosophy. So long answer, but that's that's the that's where it's all going. You know, Professor Wright, at the end, when I make notes about a book like this, I try and summarize for myself what the impact was. And one of the conclusions they came away from, and I'll discuss a few more of them, is we are all on the road to Emmaus. But unlike, and you spend a lot of time about being on the road to Emmaus, but we're in right. the middle of a throng, and the throng is all headed in the same direction, and you're trying to get out of the, and that's modern Epicure, Ep, Epicureanism. Epicurean. Yep. And the yep. Enlightenment is all pushing us down this road away yep. from the time of Jesus, away from Second Temple Jewelry. <laughs> and you're saying, get out of that road, turn around and go back. And it's very oh. difficult to go against that throng. Is that a fair <laughs> assessment? Uh, yeah, I think that is completely fair. And it's why so often we get ourselves twisted up this way and that, because one of the things that's happened, and this is, of course, very relevant to where we are right now, is that the Enlightenment 
has tried to get what should be the results of Christian belief without having the Christian belief underneath. For instance, it's tried to get social care or medical care or particularly uh, a polychrome, multicultural, globalized society, but without the gospel of Jesus at the heart of it. And uh, the church should have been modeling the idea of a polychrome, um, multicultural society, all one in Christ Jesus, as Paul says in Galatians and Colossians. But we just haven't been doing that for the last 400 years. And so we have colluded with certain aspects of Western culture, which divides us up. And so when the Enlightenment then comes with its big agenda, says, um, you're all basically the same, so you should all get together and won't that be nice. And then we worry because we have racism or uh, etc. So rampant. The answer is the church should have been modeling all along what it should have been like. And that's a Jewish vision, a vision of a differentiated unity which you can hold on to from a Jewish and a Christian point of view, but it's very, very difficult to hold on to it from the modern secular point of view. Um, so that's one of the reasons we've got in line are in right now. Now, I, I want to assure everyone who's listening that it, at the center of the book uh, that I'm holding up, History and Eschatology, are two declarations. On page 190, Professor Wright writes, the resurrection is impossible for an Epicurean, undesirable for a Platonist, unnecessary for a deist, meaningless for a pantheist, scary for an emperor. Uh, Professor Wright plants his flag on the resurrection and defends it. And on page 193, in what is a very winsome passage, you quote Karl Barth leaning over to a fellow theologian and remarking, quote, with considerable force, mark well bodily resurrection. You add, Professor Wright, that was a fine moment in the history of modern theology. Why, Professor? <laughs> because for so long, modern Western theology had just assumed that when people talked about the resurrection of Jesus, we all basically knew that it didn't happen and it hadn't happened and that it was just uh, a metaphor for something else, that Jesus' cause lives on, or that uh, he is now the world's true Lord, or that our sins are now forgiven or something. But the idea that he was bodily raised from the dead, leaving an empty tomb behind him, right through the 19th century, most all Western, um, certainly Protestant theologians, just discounted that. And so to have Karl Barth, and this was at the end of his life in the 1960s, saying that he had come to the point of view where he realized it actually meant bodily resurrection it meant what it said and we had to reorder around it that that that's that was a great moment but the point is why did it take him so long and the answer was that even Barth, who was one of the greatest theologians of the 20th century, had been so steeped in that point of view that, that it took him a long time to work back to it. Um, but ultimately, this is the Jewish perspective that in the Jewish worldview, insofar as there is one thing we can call the Jewish worldview, there are two great things you have to say about God. One, he is the good and wise creator. Two, he is the God of justice who will put all things right. If you take away either of those, you don't need bodily resurrection. But if you've got both of them, then you have to say that God is planning to reaffirm the goodness of the created order. That, for me, is the hinge, as you rightly observe, upon which the argument of this book turns, that it's then in the created order itself, however mysterious, that we can see that God is doing a new thing. I mean, the title of this book is History and Eschatology, but the original title was Discerning the Dawn. I, I, will, I will show you the, um, the poster of the original lectures. There it is, Discerning the Dawn. Um, do you see? History yes, I do. And in, in fact, it's in the YouTube video of the Gifford lecture that I watched. Oh, uh, oh you were introduced as Discerning the Dawn, and I wonder why you made that choice, or did your editor make it for you? Uh, well, it was a conversation, shall we say, between me and my editor, because he said, Tom, nobody will know what you mean by discerning the dawn. Um, I, I kind of like that phrase, and I would still use it a bit in the book. But part of the reason for history and eschatology being the title is that one of my main conversation partners, as you mentioned, is Rudolf Bultmann. And Bultmann was the last New Testament scholar before me to do the Gifford Lectures. That's way back in the 50s. That's like 60 years before me. It was another New Testament scholar doing it. So we decided to use his title, History and Eschatology, which is, of course, very ah. much what 
book is about, in order to say the conversation continues over that 60 year break. And maybe in another 60 years, there'll be somebody else doing it. But um, so the uh, but let me talk about discerning the dawn, because the point is that with the resurrection of Jesus and then with the work of the spirit through the church in the world, what you ought to be able to see if the church is doing its job, which it isn't always, but does sometimes, is the signs of new creation and the signs of new creation when you think about them retrospectively validate all the signs that you thought might be hints and signs of the presence of god within the old creation so in chapter seven i talk about um, the broken signposts the, the things like love and justice and and truth and and freedom which uh, Everybody, all humans, they know that these are good things, but they're strangely elusive. They let us down just when we think, ah, here is the sign that there is a God. Then love goes cold or truth is denied or freedom is squashed or whatever it is. And 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 so uh, people then say, like Jean-Paul Sartre, oh, life's just a sick joke. You can forget that. Instead, the resurrection says, no, these really were signals that uh si signals of the presence of god but in order to understand them to read them aright if you like draw the right conclusions from them you have to follow them through into the story of jesus because the story of jesus going to the cross is precisely a story of justice denied love trampled upon uh, truth spat upon etc etc that, that it isn't that these are ladders up which we can climb to god these are places where in their very brokenness god came down to us in the person of jesus and in his crucifixion so there you are that's the very central argument of the book it is i found fascinating the epistemology of love and i want every one in the audience to know you're going to have to like climbing a mountain work harder on the first part and then you pick up speed as you go down and i found the second part a joy to read because i had done the work of the first part yeah, yeah now exactly. The oppression of modernity. I want to. I want to sum it up for you. You talk about defeating the defeaters, and and why it's important to know Second Temple theology in order to defeat the defeaters. I've hosted Richard Dawkins and Christopher Hitchens on this show. Chris was actually a good friend of mine. Here is Richard Dawkins on the show summarizing what it is to go uphill in the face of the Epicurean split-level worldview. Would you play that clip for me, Dwayne? Okay, do you believe Jesus turned water into wine? Yes. You seriously do? Yes. You actually think that Jesus got water and made all those molecules turn into wine? Yes. My God. Yes. Okay. My I God, think. actually, not yours. And, and you know, uh, uh, Professor Wright, when I've had Mark Roberts debate Hitch, when I've had John Mark Reynolds debate Hitch, when I've had David Allen White debate Hitch, it's never hard for a theologian to win these arguments. It's awfully hard for a layman who tries. I mean, the, the oppression of the Enlightenment is everywhere. Mm -hmm. Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. But the trouble then is that many Christians, I think particularly in certain schools of American thought, many Christians think they have to answer the Enlightenment in its own terms, as it were. Yes. Now, this, you, th th this is why there's a long, quite perhaps quite difficult chapter on history, chapter three, because people have said history, but what they've actually meant is what Hume and Gibbon were doing with history in the 18th century, namely a skeptical historiography, which ruled out from the start any possibility of God's involvement with the life of this world. So they, they get rid of that. And then they say, now we're going to do history. And we're going to show you that Jesus was just a good Jewish boy, that the resurrection never happened, da, 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 the usual catalog of denials. Uh, and so I, I had to take hold of this concept of history and wrestle with it. And it gets more complicated, as you discovered, the more you go on, because different people have meant different things by it. And, and history is not a neutral point to which we can appeal. It itself has been mangled through the different cultural storms of the last 200 years. But then when we do that, and when we actually get back to saying history really is a form of knowledge, it's not just guesswork, it's not just opinion, it's a form of knowledge. And this is how it works. Here's the evidence, you form hypotheses, you make judgments, they get corrected in the light of more evidence, and so on. Just in fact, pretty much like the hard sciences, except that you can't repeat the experiment in another laboratory, because the sort of data you're dealing with doesn't allow for that. And so out of, out of all of that, I want to say, 
yes, the Enlightenment, uh, the train is coming down the tracks. It may seem impossible to stop it. But actually, we have to say a lot of this is self-serving imperial rhetoric because yes, it's the yes. same it's the same rhetoric that led the british the americans the french the germans to go charging off around the world saying we are now the enlightened ones we are going to share our civilization with you we are going to give you our justice our freedom our peace and by the way you will pay us the taxes and you and we will take all your diamonds and blah 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 boom and that's been the story so this is of course i'm just doing the standard postmodern critique of uh, the, the 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 modernist uh, enlightenment paradigm but but so if your choice is between the epicureanism of the enlightenment and the nihilism of postmodernity that's a pretty poor choice to have and that's where we need other options on the table and the jewish option about a god who made the world who is other than the world who has purposes for the world but is not identified with the world as in stoicism um, that option has usually not been discussed because in western thought the jews have been oh well that's just the jews there's been a latent anti-judaism in western culture and particularly in protestant culture where people have said well the jews believed in justification by works and we know that's wrong so we don't need to learn anything from them um, and what i'm pleading for and i'm interested that you say that the first half of the book was like climbing up one side of the mountain and then you can go down more easily the other that's exactly how it has to be because without that first half you don't get to the point where you can then see how the thing will flow well i'm a a fairly significant consumer of history and tom holland over at oxford i, I oh. i've been reading his books as i read history and eschatology and right. in the middle of your book, you describe your method as a slow flanking movement. And I thought, okay, you're the Scipio Africanus of theologians, but it was necessary. You have yeah, to yeah. defeat all of these movements or at least yeah. acknowledge and argue with them from a position of understanding their tricks. And you've empowered exactly. me by doing that. And I think the church actually has to do that if it's going to succeed in this, this really radical postmodernism with which we are burdened now. I I, I, I totally agree. And I'm glad you've been reading Tom Holland. I did a, a discussion with him on one, one of the podcasts in London um, a year or so ago, yeah, maybe two years ago. And we got on really well. I'm glad he, he's I wouldn't say he's a close friend because we haven't met since we've emailed from time to time. But I've read most of his stuff. He's a remarkable man. And he has found his way into the doorway of Christian faith yes. through his own historical research, which is fascinating. Who would have thought that that would happen in this day and age? But it's partly because he's the kind of historian who just reads everything. He just knows his way around the whole field. And he can see the the places where the modernist critique has just become a bit too slippery for its own good and where the power of the Christian gospel still comes through despite everything. And he obviously chronicles um, the follies and failings of the church as much as anyone else does. Can I ask you, Professor Wright, why you think the defeaters are omnipresent. I mean, <clears throat> when I spent uh, time with Robert Funk for a television show I did in Los Angeles two decades ago, Robert Funk came around when he was still alive to, to sell the Jesus Seminar book. And luckily I had Mark Roberts available to me and he prepared me. And it's pretty easy to dispatch the Jesus Seminar with even a few hours preparation by a serious theologian using the, the, the techniques of the law. But they're never defeated. They keep coming back. What is it that threatens the defeaters so much about a historically grounded Christianity? That's a great question. And, and, and I would say, by the way, I mean, I was involved in Jesus research at the same time as the Jesus seminar was going on. And what your viewers may not know is that none of the major Jesus scholars in America at the time, with the exception of Dominic Cross and, and Marcus Borg, who were both serious scholars, none of the other regular Jesus scholars like Ed Sanders or Jim Charlesworth or John Paul Meyer, uh, several others I could name, none of them joined in with that movement. It was always seen by the, the other scholars as a flaky, rather odd movement because Bob Funk was a rather strange character, big, a big dog in all sorts of ways and, and very good at some things. But, but anyway, so you hear what I'm saying, that don't take that as the only representative. However, you're absolutely right that even if they, they seem to be knocked out, they keep coming back because it's in the DNA of Western culture and especially, I think, American culture. And I've spent a long time in America than, um, over the years um, to, 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 to have a view of early Christianity, which says, well, Jesus was no doubt a great guy telling us about 
freedom and love and peace. Um, he had some funny ideas, apocalyptic ideas, which he got from his Jewish context, but we can discount those. And basically treating Jesus as an advance prophet of John Locke and Thomas Jefferson and the American Enlightenment. Um, and, and Ed Sanders, actually, who is a fine historian, when it comes down to his own personal agendas, he has an article recently saying exactly that, that Jesus and Paul and the early Jews are pointing forward to the 18th century Enlightenment. And then he says, touchingly, sadly, it doesn't seem to be going too well now. And so our culture as a whole has bought into the Enlightenment vision, and especially the, the American you know, the founding fathers were, were exactly there. Thomas Jefferson said, I am an Epicurean, as I quote in this book. He was a lot of other things as well, but certainly that. And, and it's the way our culture has worked to get God out of the picture so that we can run the downstairs world. And any idea then of the kingdom of God, of Jesus inaugurating God's rule on earth as in heaven, you mentioned my earlier a much shorter book, How God Became King, that's obviously what it's about, that's simply not wanted on the voyage. And so, um, because it, it disrupts our whole way of life, it might make us stop and ask difficult questions. Um, obviously, right now at the moment, difficult questions about uh, racial integrity or integration, uh, uh, about the past history of Britain and America and many other countries as well. We don't want to ask those questions. So it's safer to keep Jesus as a good first century Jewish boy with some nice ideas. But of course, let's not take him too seriously. And please, let's not imagine that he rose from the dead. And so there are deep cultural reasons. And here's the heart of it. I think I mentioned this in the book. Our narrative in the Western world has been that world history reached its great uh, apocalyptic moment in the 18th century with Rousseau and Jefferson and all the other great Enlightenment savants, uh, Kant and Hegel and so on, and that now we live in the modern world, which is totally different from the ancient world, so we take our orders from the Enlightenment agendas, the, the so-called modern freedom dem democratic agendas. Now, um, that has a lot going for it, but what happens as a result is that you must then disbelieve in Jesus' resurrection, not just because you're a modern scientist and you know that dead people don't rise. Well, they knew that in the ancient world as well, but because history cannot have two climaxes. And if you have placed the climax of history in the 18th century enlightenment, and if you're living out of that dream, then you cannot allow that Jesus of Nazareth would have been raised from the dead in the first century and that you should be living out of that dream. That's a straight choice. And I've argued in this book and elsewhere that we should choose Jesus. I agree with you that we should, but I also think you do me a great service as a lawyer and a fan of the Constitution. I've been teaching constitutional law for 25 years by recognizing that Second Temple Judaism, the, 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 the construct for thinking that you offer as an alternative to the Enlightenment, mm. uh, elevates justice, beauty, freedom, truth and power, spirituality and relationships. And that the Enlightenment is very good on freedom. And the Constitution of the United States is very good on freedom, within which N.T. Wright and uh, Pope Benedict and other great theologians can flourish if we hold true so they can inform how we ought to live once we brought order to the world. I think there's a synthesis between the best of the Enlightenment and the necessity of the resurrection. I really do, Professor Wright. I, and you made that easier for me to defend in this book. Well, um, it, it depends what you mean by the best of the Enlightenment, because, of course, freedom, as I say in the book, is, is a very complicated topic. And uh, the, the great uh, other revolution that was going on at the same time as the American Revolution was the French Revolution, Liberté, Egalité, Fraternité. And they ended up guillotining two thirds of their own fellow revolutionaries in order to make the point that once you uh, have these big abstract ideals, it's actually harder to put them into practice than you might have imagined. And so often, as we've seen and as we're still freeing, seeing, one person's freedom can be purchased at the expense of someone else's slavery. And and we of all people, after three centuries of, of or three or more centuries of all of that, we ought to know that. Um, so, so how you then do freedom wisely for all people. You know, the American Constitution, I'm not a constitutional law lawyer at all, but I understand that it does open with grand flourishes about how all people are created equal, etc. Um, and yet Thomas Jefferson, who uh, wrote those words, I think if I'm right, 
um, he was himself a slave owner and there were all sorts of ambiguities going on there and it took quite a while to iron out that one and another century before we even got to Martin Luther King and, um, and 50 years after Martin Luther King we're still trying to figure out what does it mean to be free at last which I think was one of his things wasn't it? Yes, yeah, so the apple of gold in the frame of silver. The apple of gold, Lincoln argued, is the declaration. But the frame of silver that makes it perfect is the Constitution as amended by the 14th Amendment, which brought through Lincoln's agency in an awful civil war that cost 600,000 yeah, yeah. freedom. And that's still a progress. I mean, as we saw over the yeah, last few yeah. weeks, it's still a work in progress. Yeah, but yeah. only law allows us to explore, as you do, claims of knowledge which you say often masquerade or, or actually cover claims to power and you want to get rid of those claims to power or at least unmask them and i and i think i i would be comfortable arguing only in a constitutional republic will we ever continue to make progress we can't allow authoritarians to do this uh professor right they'll never deliver this sounds like a typical american versus british um uh, discussion <laughs> Uh, you know, I, I know enough American theologians to tell when they're simply channeling the glorious revolution and, and what they basically want to get rid of George III and, and all the bishops he was trying to send over. And, you know, we, 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 we know this game. Um, and and, and we, I'm not saying we British have got it right. We're, as usual, just sort of muddled and sitting in the middle and wondering what all the fuss is about, um, which is a very, a very typical British stance. But I think it, out, out of all of that, um, I, I want to say that I'm not a politician, I'm not a, a lawyer or a political lawyer or anything, but I do have a sense that, that there's a constant paradox between authority and freedom. And yes. if you say, uh, well, freedom, freedom, freedom is what we want. Well, OK, by bombing Saddam Hussein 17 years ago, uh, we gave the Iraqis their freedom because we liberated them from that tyrant. Well, actually, I think in the year or two after Saddam Hussein was killed and or on, onward from there, um, anarchy turned out to be far worse than even tyranny had been. And I'm no fan of tyranny, but nor am I a fan of anarchy. So how you say freedom without it turning into anarchy is very difficult. And we all wrestle with that, just like how you say authority or wise rule without it turning into tyranny. And and I know there's been masses and masses written on this. Of course, it's a major, it's a, it's a, a university degree and more in itself right there. But it seems to me that, ironically, perhaps, because of, of so much of the Enlightenment wanting to get rid of God, because of seeing God as a, a big bully in the sky trying to tell us what to do. When you put the God we see in Jesus in the middle of that picture and say, what might it look like if this God, the God who wept at the tomb of his friend, the, 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 the God who... Uh, knelt and washed the disciples' feet, the God who went to be crucified with King of the Jews above his head. What happens if you put this God in charge of the world and say, supposing the way the world ought to run is by people following Jesus and doing what he said? How would that be? I think that's what the Sermon on the Mount's about. It's not just a miscellaneous set of ethical ideals. It's a way of Jesus saying, this is how the kingdom of God is going to come through the mourners and the peacemakers and the hungry for justice people and the, uh, the, the all those other people listed in, in Matthew 5. And when we have that sort of vision, I think that challenges the modern enlightenment notions of freedom, which can often be self-serving just as much as it challenges the pre-enlightenment notions of authority, which were obviously often tyrannical. Anyway, that's a huge conversation we just opened there. It is. A statesmanship is so difficult. It requires prudence, and prudence requires wisdom, and wisdom, I think, resides in Scripture. And so that's why I want people to understand it correctly. That's why I want to go to your two central parables, because we don't have right. an endless amount of time. People have sure, to sure. tackle history. But I do want to get to the the college that has received the masterpiece and the waiting chalice. And, and I okay. think they're beautiful. They are so effective. Would you explain them both? OK, OK. The, the college that's received the masterpiece was an idea that first occurred to me about 40 years ago when I was a young research fellow in Merton College in Oxford. I'm sitting in Oxford now talking to you. And uh, it actually happened that some artist who was an old member of the college or something like that gave the college this great painting and nobody knew what to do with it. 
and I imagined, I, I elaborated that for the purpose of the parable, that uh, uh, you, 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 the painting, it won't go in the senior common room. You can't put it in the hall because uh, you've got old portraits of people there and it won't match that. You can't put it in the chapel. It's not appropriate. We don't have a space for this great, amazing masterpiece. So what you're going to do is you're going to have to redesign the college putting this in the middle and then developing the parable beyond the bounds of plausibility within Oxford College. Um, I imagine that as they redesign some of the existing buildings with this thing as the focal point, then all sorts of things which were problematic about the previous buildings, you know, the, the, the bathrooms that or the plumbing didn't quite work or the student rooms that weren't quite big enough or whatever it was, they all gradually get sorted out. So here's how the parable works. The resurrection, Jesus bodily being raised from the dead, doesn't actually fit within our present post-enlightenment worldviews because we say we don't believe in a God who intervenes. We, we just believe that God's away in somewhere else and, and we're down here. So it doesn't fit. But hang on, this is such a big, powerful thing and it makes so much sense of so many other things. Supposing we redesigned our worldviews with this in the middle, then it wouldn't be the case, and here's the point of the extra twiddle at the end of the parable, it wouldn't be the case that we had to abandon the college altogether and build a totally new one. What would happen would be that we would find ourselves redesigning the existing yes. buildings, and as we did so, we'd found that they made the sense they should have made all along, but had never quite managed to. So that's the point, that it isn't that resurrection just won't fit and you either have to say, I'm a supernaturalist or you're a naturalist or whatever. That, I hate that antithesis, as you'll have picked up in the book, um, that comes straight out of that Epicureanism. Rather, yes. I want to say, when you put the resurrection in the middle, it makes sense of everything else. In other words, this is a C.S. Lewis image. Once the sun has risen, one of the ways you know it's risen is because not just you can see the sun, but you can see everything else. That's how that image was supposed to work. So that was that one. Um, does that make sense? The waiting you, chalice. Uh, yeah, yeah, the waiting chalice, of course. Yeah, I love this image because it's got all sorts of resonances, not least sacramental, Eucharistic, etc. And I, I imagine... Um, I, I imagine uh, somebody finding in in a junk shop uh, an, an old chalice, um, w w which they didn't know what it was, and imagine that all memory of Christianity had been lost, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But here's this beautiful silver cup with some engravings and some markings on it, and and they're they're wondering what it is. And uh, somebody says, well, it's obviously it's a drinking vessel of some sort. Um, it's it's beautiful, it's stunning, it's amazing, but they can't quite figure out uh, what what would it be for and what were these markings all about? And the answer is, you don't know what they're all about until you realize what it's meant to be filled with and what it's meant to be filled with in the Eucharist, in the Holy Communion service, is the, the outpoured wine, which symbolically, actually, however you want to say it, is stroke represents stroke becomes the blood of Christ uh, and is for the feeding of the faithful and their strengthening for service, etc. So then I imagine the world itself as we see it at the moment, like the waiting chalice, because we are told in some of those marvelous Old Testament passages that the earth shall be full of the glory of God as the waters cover the sea. And that's what I think gave me the idea for that image that God intends to fill the present world with his own glory in a way which at the moment we only just glimpse in fragments. So that as we look at the world at the moment, what we are seeing is a vessel which obviously means all sorts of things and has symbols around it which are telling us something, but we're not sure what. But when we realize that the world is designed to be filled with the glory of the creator God, then all those symbols and signals make sense at last. And so for me, this fuels the missiology, which says that the task of the church in the power of the spirit is to be uh, agents in the present time of such short term, small scale fillings of the world with God's glory as we can in order to show that the signals, the markings around the cup, if you like, in the original in the original picture were in fact telling the truth, even though it's only now that we can see what that truth is and how it works. Th does that make sense? Um, oh, it does. All, it, and Professor, uh, when you added the detail of now imagine that we're translucent, I thought that's beautiful writing. Ah, so my hat is off yes, to you yes, because that yes. made it resonate. 
Um, yes, yes. The now and um, not yet nature of the yep. world. I wrote, Mike, I'll take away three things from this book for a long time. Now and not yet encapsulates how a Christian ought to live. Would you expand on that? Throughout the New Testament, the extraordinary impact of Jesus forces his early followers to say that something has happened as a result of which the world is a different place. And those who belong to Jesus, who believe in him and have been baptized into, be, into being part of his corporate identity, as it were, this funny thing we call the church, we too, something has happened to us as a result of which we can't be the same again. We can be apostates, we can throw, our, uh, throw dust on the whole thing, but we can never be people who have never gone through that, as it were. And um, so there is a now about the whole thing. The word now is one of the great New Testament words, but now, says Paul, or Jesus saying, the time is fulfilled, the kingdom of God is at hand. So this is a now moment. However, there is always an overlap. There is a sense that there's something much more. And when people say now it's fulfilled and we are already part of God's kingdom project, they say, hang on, the world is still a mess. Look out of the window. There's murder and yeah. mayhem and all kinds of crazy nonsense going on. And the early Christians were just as much aware of that as we are. They were being killed. They were being persecuted. Paul wrote some of his greatest letters from prison, including those letters where he says dramatically that Christ has won the victory over all the principalities and powers. And you can imagine somebody saying to him, Paul, how can you say that when there's a Roman guard at the gate of your prison and you're wearing chains. And he says, no, this is already true. And we live in this, in this gap between the now and the not yet. And we are to be people of the now. And one of his powerful images for that, several times he uses it, Romans 13, 1 Thessalonians 5, elsewhere, is about the day dawning. And I use the image of jet lag to get at this. I fly to and fro to the States quite a bit, not at the moment because of lockdown, but I've done it a lot over the years. And I'm well used to being in America and waking up in the middle of the night feeling sleepy because my phone has just buzzed and somebody from the UK who doesn't know I'm in America thinks it's daytime, Tom should be awake, let's call him. And, and the, the answer is that it's already daytime in God's new creation and we are to be people of the day. Therefore, we are not to behave as though the night was still going on, as though it was still dark. We are to be people who are up and about, even though the rest of the world is working on a different time. And as you'll have picked up, and it, I, I found this fascinating researching this, in several Jewish contexts, I think not all Jewish writers, but many of them will say that the Sabbath was always meant to function like this, that every seventh day, you step forward in time, or rather, God's future comes to meet you in the present, so that on the Sabbath, you are living in God's future, even though you know that the boring old present is rumbling along, and you've got to go back to work tomorrow morning, or back to suffering and, and all the troubles of, of being a Jew in the modern world. And so that idea of God's future arriving in the present is not a new idea with Christianity. It's an idea the Christians inhabited because Jesus himself said the time is fulfilled, which is why Jesus did all the stuff he did on the Sabbath as a way of saying this is God's new day right now because I'm here. He's the temple in person. He's the Sabbath in person. So it plays out in terms of this now and not yet existence of the celebrating of what is already true and the grieving and lamenting over the fact that there is still sin and suffering and death. And, and all kinds of prejudice and nonsense in the world. Yeah, I, I'm quite certain, I don't know, but I'm certain that Dennis Prager, who's a very accomplished theologian and an Orthodox Jew, uh, not quite Orthodox, he would say, would be very comfortable with your understanding of Second Temple Judaism, the significance of the Temple and the significance of the Sabbath. I found that it fascinating. But I'll bet you Boltman himself would have to admit the power of where I want to conclude, which are not on parables, but on two factual stories you tell. The story of the exhibition that the critics hated and the story of the French lad. I think it would be useful if you gave our audience glimpses of those two factual accounts that I think would just turn Mr. Boltman on his head. <laughs> yes, I mean, Boltman struggled because he was in the 1930s. 
um, in, in Marburg when Heidegger was the chancellor of the university and Heidegger was a, was a Nazi sympathizer, etc. And Bultmann was struggling to live in that very difficult time. So I don't want to say that he was silly or stupid or wicked. I just think that was a really tough time. And I, I hope if sure. I'm ever in such a tough time yeah. as this, etc. So anyway, um, OK, the exhibition, this was in 2000. And it was at the National Gallery in London. And I was living in Westminster at the time. So just a short walk from the National Gallery. And Neil McGregor was the director of the National Gallery. And he's a practicing Christian. And he put on an exhibition for the, for the millennium called Seeing Salvation, which were mostly paintings of the crucifixion. There were lots of other very interesting objects and artworks and so on. But the bulk of the exhibition was the story of Jesus and particularly his crucifixion. And the newspaper critics went and saw it at the beginning and they said, oh, this is so old hat. Who needs to see all these pictures of some poor guy being tortured to death 2000 years ago? Surely we can do better than that in the modern world. And my wife and I went to the exhibition. I think we went three or four times, um, but not just us. I mean, naturally we would. But the general public voted with their feet and came again and again and again in droves. And it showed that the critics were out of touch because the general public looking at those paintings of the cross could see in a pre-articulate way that something there was to be learned about the love of God reaching down into the mess and muddle of our life. And I find that very powerful. And I tell other stories about that as well. But then the other one, it's a well-known story now, but um, uh, when I was writing this book, I finally managed to find um, who, who it was. And it was the Roman Catholic Archbishop of Paris who was who was telling the story. And uh, I'll, you, you can tell me his name if you like, because I, I do I can't mention recall it. I, I didn't write it in my notes, uh, Professor. Yeah. Uh, I've got it. It's, it's Jean-Marie Lustiger, Lustiger, L-U-S-T-I-G-E-R. And he was Jewish himself. And when he was a young man, uh, he went as, as a careless, atheistic young Jew, I think, um, living in a French provincial town. Three, he and two friends went into a Catholic church and played a trick on the priest by going and confessing all kinds of sins, which, of course, they hadn't committed. The priest knew perfectly well. The other two ran away, but the priest said to Lustiger, young Lustiger, I've got a penance for you. I want you to walk up to the other end of the church, big crucifix there, there's Jesus on the cross, look in his face and say, you did all that for me, and I don't give a damn. And I want you to do that three times. And so the boy went off and first time, you did all that for me, I don't give a damn, fine. Then he did it, and then he couldn't do it the third time. Because looking at the figure on the cross and thinking, you did all that for me, it radically, totally changed his life. And he left the church and left his atheism and became a Christian and years and years later became Archbishop of Paris. And the way he told the story was to tell the story as of a young boy, whoever, and then to say, and the reason I know the story is that I was that young man. That's powerful an story, powerfully it's told. A, in, story. Yeah. Po powerfully told in history and eschatology. I've got to ask, have you sent history and eschatology to Pope Benedict, the Pope Emeritus? Uh, good question. I... I honestly don't know. I may have done, because when it came out, I sent the book in various directions. Um, but but, but that's a good question. I don't know that I have. I'm not sure it's translated into German. I think his German is better than his English. Um, but uh, I have given him books in the past, and maybe I should send him this one and see what he would make of it. Thanks I really, be, Because your argument is with many of the Germans, and because he is a German who is sympathetic to your argument, I believe, I would love to, and I think of him as the greatest living theologian, I would love to hear if he thinks you've beaten the German problem. I want to end there. Why are the Germans, and, and I don't mean this as an ethnic issue, but as a theological yeah. issue, why do they go that way when so many other great theologians like yourselves and many others go the other way? It's very deeply within the German Enlightenment culture, going back to Kant and Hegel. And if you've had great philosophers like that within your own cultural tradition, it's very hard just to say, let's step aside from that. I mean, if you look at the great names in theology over the last 200 years, certainly down the Protestant line, that's what you get. Not only Kant and Hegel, but also all the people like Schleiermacher and Schopenhauer and uh, Fichte and then and Nietzsche, of course, who Schweitzer uh, made Nietzsche his, his great hero. Um, even grow a moustache like, like Nietzsche's. Um, so that there is a sort of deeply, this is the tradition with which you have to deal.
um, and you can't step outside it because German theology has always liked to think of itself as wissenschaftlich, scientific. In other words, you're building on the work of your predecessors. And if somebody comes along and says, forget all those stupid predecessors, just kick them out of the way and do it totally differently, then you're liable not to get published. You're liable not to be taken seriously. Now, we all have our own traditions to which we have to kowtow, and I and others, no doubt, the same. But I think that's the answer to your particular question. And my last question, Professor, having done all this work, I mean, 80 books, and this is really a monumental work, history and eschatology. Are you an optimist that the real Jesus, the resurrected Jesus, has a chance in places like the totalitarian PRC, much less the liberal America and Great Britain? Does it? Does he have the a total- chance? What is the totalitarian PRC? Uh, People's Republic of China. Oh, 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 sorry. Sorry, I don't, didn't know that acronym. Um, oh, yes. Jesus is always capable of bursting out. I mean, that's what the resurrection is all about. They put a stone there and seal it. And guess what? He's raised from the dead and he's out and about and doing stuff. And it's exactly the same today. And I, I've never been to China. There is a very thriving Christian church in China. It's not easy being a Christian in China, but there are many loyal, devout Christians there. And I pray regularly that God will raise up wise, strong Christian leadership that might actually change the course of that nation, never mind uh, have a, a spiritual impact on many millions of people living there. But yes, Jesus has done great things in the past. He is waiting to do great things in the present and future. Our task is to be faithful and loyal, follow our vocations, say our prayers, be ready for whatever he is going to, wherever he's going to lead us. And that is a great place on which to end. Uh, Professor Wright, you've been generous again. Thank you for history and eschatology. Thank Thank you for explaining it for me. And thank you for joining me on the Hugh Hewitt Show. And thank you for reading it and giving it such good time. Bless you. Good to be with you. Bless you. Thank you.